the Last Minute Blues Podcast with Jeff Burton, Donnie Fandango, and former Blues defenseman Jamie Rivers. Powered by Together Credit Union, empowering you to achieve your financial goals. It is the Last Minute Blues Podcast. Jeff Burton, Jamie Rivers, Donnie Fandango. Um, I think Jamie slept very well last yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. Or had a really great gym session this morning or something. Our man is pumped up. A really great gym session last night. Okay. Uh, here's a question. No, it's open 24 hours. What? God, I'm not he's... talking about your workbench. We're talking about. <laughs> I'm a happy man, Jeff. Yeah, I'm tell. a happy man. I can tell. Well, you can tell. You know, yes. there's a, and when you're having a good day, there's a really easy way to throw a wrench in the entire thing because I did that today. You know, even even still, I still try to go out in the woods and at least just sit there and feel nature and smell nature and work through things mentally, right? And every once in a while, I get bug bites, oh, no. ticks, things like that. I wear my watch on my left wrist, and I had a tick or a bug or something there, so I got this. Looks kind of gnarly. It's just a little red dot. Yeah. Right? So I was like, well, I can't put my watch there, so I put it on my opposite wrist. And I know you're not a watch guy, but I mean, I feel like I'm- You're off balance? I'm brushing my teeth with the wrong hand or something. Yeah, so- it's Really weird. I got this watch for Christmas from my kids because they- Figured they, they started working out, and I'm you know, trying to be all fit and stuff. And I always said, I don't need a, I don't need an Apple Watch or anything like that. No free ads, by the way. If you want to send us Apple product, feel free to do so. Yeah. Um, or money. More money or anything. For gift cards are acceptable as well these days. <laughs> but, uh, so I never wore a watch. I never looked at it. I always looking at my phone, looking at my phone. Since I've got this watch, I look at it all the time. All yeah. my text messages and all that. It gets kind of annoying sometimes. But then there's a couple of days where I forgot to put it on. Yeah. I go the whole day staring at a, a wrist that has nothing on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to tell you, and kind of on that, that side of things, I am trying to do a better job when I get home of setting my phone down and leaving it down. Yeah. You know, I, I just find myself checking the damn thing all the time, even when I don't need. There is nothing in the world that is that important that somebody couldn't call me about yeah. that I need to check it so much. But you just get in that habit, man. What if there's a uh, music emergency around here? You right. never know. Yeah, well, uh, you're you're right. <laughs> I've been I trying to do that too. I've been trying to get home and like once it's kind of I call it like quiet time, shutdown time. We uh, I put the phone down or I'll put it upstairs on the charger, and I'm just like, you know what? Nothing's that important. If my kids need me, I'm like 12 houses away yeah. from where they're at. And if they need to call me that bad, they have other people's numbers who are right with me who they can call and tell me. But it, it does help my day out. That's yeah, for sure. I mean, because you just, I find myself like, like scrolling, like just scrolling like silly stuff that like yeah. I don't even need to be, I should be. That's why I well, got off of Facebook okay. a bunch of years ago and I've since gotten back on for business purposes. But I just remember going, I'm looking at other people's lives. Yeah. How about other people's negative lives? Yeah, there's like that that's too. the biggest problem I have about like Facebook. Twitter is a whole other animal. Like, you know, I take Twitter with a grain of salt, you know, kind of like it's amusing. It's like the Jerry Springer show, you know, it's amusing. You don't take it too seriously. Every now and then there's something that's cool that pops up. But Facebook, I wish people would just take like one day a week and just post something positive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's some people that are just wah, wah, wah every single day. And I'm like, like, I am your friend and, and I, I feel bad or, but like, come on, you're bringing me down. Yeah. yeah man. The, the stuff that go, the people that go try to find something negative, like the, the, the soccer team, St. Louis City FC, uh, they, you know, did a little tease yesterday saying we got something brewing and it was a picture of their kit with some sort of animal next to it. And it turns out today it was a Clydesdale because they're going to be doing the, that's, you know, I guess the, the beverages down there or whatever. And people are like, oh, AP in there. I guess I'm not going to those games. Really? Some people it, just hate life, Jeff. That's it, huh? It, it, you can really even tell. And, like, I, it used to be something on, on Twitter and that when, it, when you're talking about, like, the Blues or the Cardinals or something where I would get so riled up when people would, would start their buffoonery. Yeah. But, like, now it's just I just expect it, man. Like, the, the, seriously, so the Blues could win tonight 7 to nothing. They could put 50 shots on Minnesota. Bennington could stand on his head. But there would be something that some of these people want to pick out from the game. Oh well, if you try to do that against Colorado, you're going to get. And it's just hey, like, why, why don't we just 
Why don't you save some of those goals for the next round? <laughs> right. It's just like, is what point of this do you <laughs> enjoy good. it? You yeah, know? Both of you. That is good, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was good. That was good. But we don't want to talk about Colorado yet because the Blues no. have work to do. They got yeah, it. They, they got work really to do. do. This and is the toughest what? game tonight. This is, is going to be the hardest one. Now, I read something, and I, I want to say it was Jeremy Rutherford because I'm in non-sexual love with him. I'm just assuming it was him. But he said talking about Bennington, one of the reasons why he's so good, and I'd like you to maybe tell us, clue us when we can see this but he said Bennington is challenging shooters which means he's confident yeah look at Jordan Bennington when we remember him from 2019 and I get frustrated with some of the Blues fans because to our point just two seconds ago they look for the negatives right yes how easily we forget the following season after 2019 the Stanley Cup that Jordan Bennington had 30 wins and that the Blues were in first place headed into the bubble did things go the right way no they didn't but doesn't matter then the beginning of this season the Blues don't win a number of games if Jordan Bennington is not their goaltender. He stood on his freaking head. Did he have a bit of a, a speed bump here through the middle? Yes, he absolutely did. But it doesn't mean he forgot how to play goal. And so when I watch Jordan Bennington right now, specifically in these two games, he's challenging to the top of the blue paint. And then other times when he knows, like when Jordan Bennington's dialed in, he's thinking like a hockey player, not a goalie. And what I mean by that is look at the third period. Kaprizov has a partial breakaway last game. And Jordan Bennington, ordinarily, you know, you're at top of the paint, don't get out too far. But he read the situation where he had a defender angling a certain way. Kaprizov had put his head down looking to shoot. Bennington came firing out like 10 more feet on the challenge. And Kaprizov had nothing to shoot at. So that, to me, is like Jordan Bennington is dialed in both as a goalie and thinking as a player. And the one aspect that I've been harping on all week long on the fast lane is the way he plays the puck. And we had Craig Berube on the fast lane yesterday, and he talked about it too. Look at the way Jordan Bennington plays the puck. He gets back there, and the number one thing Minnesota wanted to do is come in and be physical and get in on the four check, right? Mm -hmm. How do you nullify that? A goalie that plays the puck. Because I remember being a defenseman, and I've got these guys breathing down the back of my neck trying to put my face through the glass and take the puck away from me. When I had a goalie that could play the puck, he got out, stopped the puck. I would just become available. Who get are, open for it. Who were some of the goalies that you played with that were good with the puck and some you were just like, let me get it? Uh, Grant Fear, stay in your net, please. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You are good at a lot of things, but maybe this isn't one. <laughs> Love you, Fearsy. You know you're my man. Fearsy is one of my best friends of all time. Stay in your net. Um, that'll be helpful to everyone. <laughs> Thank you very including much. Including your own health, Fearsy. Um, but no, Curtis Joseph was great at handling the puck. Chris Osgood was phenomenal. Manny Legacy did a good job. Um, you know, some of the other guys along the way, uh, Kevin Weeks was very good mm. at playing the puck. It helps. Trust me, it helps. It nullifies the forecheck. And that's what happened with Jordan Bennington the last two games is Minnesota. If you real, if you watch the games, specifically last game, they only had one shift where they had extended zone time. And that's because Jordan Bennington's getting out. He's stopping the puck. He's like passing it to the fenceman or he's moving it to the other side or he drags it back behind the net like a D-man and snaps a tape to taper to Braden Shen, yeah. who's through the middle, and they're off to the races the other way. One exit pass with the goalie. That's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. And wow. so that so Minnesota now, they have to pump the brakes on their forecheck, which means their one of their biggest assets has been removed from them. So they've got to figure out a way to get pucks in deep without it getting into the trapezoid for Jordan Bennington. So you got to put it into the dead areas, which is the corners. You call those the dead areas because goalie can't get there. So they got to do that, but if they can't do that, it's going to be a tough night. All right, so can you look at this game from both perspectives, from both the Blues and the Wild perspective, and just kind of maybe formulate how you're going to go about going about business tonight? Obviously, you know, you the Blues got to win, man. You do not want to go back to Minnesota for game number seven, um, but I'm sure Minnesota has other other plans. In their yeah. Um, okay, so let's approach it from the Minnesota Wild standpoint first. Um you have to find a way to get yourself back into the series. And what I mean by that is last game was a heartbreaker, and your team looked like they had absolutely no juice from the very end of the second period all the way through the third, unless your name is Kapril, Kirill Kaprizov. He's the only guy that looked like he had anything left in the tank. So if I'm the Wild, I want to make sure that I'm getting pucks in deep. I'm getting sustained offensive zone time. I'm not taking penalties. I'm doing things that generate some momentum for my team. Quick changes, quick shifts. You got to kind of almost forget about the matchups at this point. You got to just be like, listen, I trust you guys. We got to go. Because the quick shifts, what it does, it keeps energized bodies on the ice, which means you'll play at a faster pace. And if you outchange the opposition at this point in the series where it's game six, game seven, you can generate extra momentum to where you can wear the other team down. 
You and, look faster. Even though you're not really a faster team, you will be playing faster. And there is talk, or at least I've read, that Barube has outcoached their coach with changes that he's made. And apparently there's changes for tonight's lineup. I haven't seen what they are uh, on the Minnesota side. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know what they are either yet. I would imagine that Nick Butestad's going to get into the lineup. They have absolutely no offense on their fourth line. That fourth line has been an f- absolute cinder block for them, just dragging them down. That's not a compliment, right? No, it's not a compliment. And, and that's because Nick Deloria and Patrick Duhame have been irrelevant in this series. Why? Because Craig Berube's fourth line is a uh, – is, Tyler Bozak, Torpchenko, and then lately with 11-7, he's able to rotate Tarasenko, Robert Thomas, Braden Shan, Ivan Barbashev. So it changes the dynamic of the fourth line to where Minnesota can't match up. If they if they play their fourth line, they're outnumbered. They're, they're outskilled. They can't keep up. So again, so getting back to the strategies of the game, Minnesota's going to have to try and generate some of that momentum. If you're the Blues... Exactly the same. You want to get the pucks in deep. You want to be, in my opinion, you always want to be tied or better after the first period with the opposition in game six. Reason being, the clock starts to become the enemy for the other team. They start to look up and like, well, that's one period down and we're we're tied or we're down by a goal. You're getting tighter. You're You're gripping the stick. The coach is starting to make erratic decisions. You start like, because you feel your season slipping away. So the longer the Blues can play tied or better, in this game tonight, the more pressure that becomes for the Minnesota Wild, and ultimately they will make a mistake. Now, it's up to the Blues to capitalize on that. If they don't capitalize on it, then, hey, that can bite you in the the you-know-what. But that's for the St. Louis Blues. Get pucks in deep. They did it last game, Jeff. I'm sure you noticed in the third period where even guys like Robert Thomas were receiving the puck and then just chipping it in deep when they didn't have a play. That cross-ice stuff that they love to do went away. And that's the signs of experience from a team that has been down this road before. How in the world, and I don't even know if it's possible, how do you slow down Kaprizov? How? How? Uh, it, well, you find out what room he's in <laughs> at the hotel. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Pull a, pull a fire alarm or something? He is one of the most impressive young players I've seen in this league. And quite honestly, uh, Bernie Federko and I have been watching him this whole series, and we're like, man, he, he might be one of the top five players in the NHL. He might be. Wow. Like, he's so fast. He's so strong. Did you guys see... I know you saw it, but did you really look at that one goal he scored on the power play last game where he received it on the backhand, brought it to the forehand, and then went short side shelf on Bennington? One, he's at a horrible angle. The Blues did a great job of pushing him to a spot where he's really not dangerous, unless your name is Caprice. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And we practice this all the time, especially when I work with skills with guys, all the different guys in the Blues and NHL guys, the Kachuk brothers. It's a quick pass from a dead area, so like the corner or behind the goal line, to the backhand. Because nobody, very seldom you ever get that picture-perfect pass in a, in a game. So you go backhand, forehand, try to shoot it. And if you're a left-handed shot, you try to go short side shelf because it's way easier. It comes off the stick faster. If you're a right-handed shot, you go backhand, forehand, over the glove. Because that would be your quickest um, release point. Kaprizov got that pass on the backhand. He went backhand, forehand, top cheese. Nobody even knew what happened. <laughs> right? Jordan Are you Bennington not teaching went... that at Synergy Hockey? <laughs> yeah, we do. We absolutely uh, do. Is there availabilities right now? Yeah, there is availability. What's the phone number and our website? Well, the website is real easy, too. SynergyHockeySkills.com. We have summer camps for 10 weeks straight for all levels. We have lessons for elite players. We have lessons for beginner players. We got you covered, and we still have a very, very few spots available, but they are. So get on the website, SynergyHockeySkills.com. It, it, it's it, it's amazing to me how the it is amazing to me like the ebb and flow of the series mm-hmm. and you know how like after you know game one we're on top of the mountain game two game three oh, oh god, god. Uh, <laughs> okay, but wait this can't end yet that was you that wasn't the players oh a hundred percent but I'm saying like this but this is what we talk about all the time for years it's like don't get too high don't get too low as yeah. fans we're like yeah. They were like, oh, son of a... <laughs> I'm just as bad now. Yeah. I'm just as bad. I try to keep it in. I try to stay focused. I try to remember what it's like to be a player. But I'm a fan now, you know, yeah, and I'm yeah. a broadcaster and all that stuff. Life has changed a little bit. But I do know these guys, and I'm pulling for them. But I feel like with a Craig Berube coached team, ever since the hand pass, I go back, I say it all the time. People are like, oh, I know the hand pass. But that, to me was such a massive turning point in this franchise. They just parked that 
They were really mad right away, but then they got together as a team and said, we're not going to let it bother us. Since that happened, this team has never had a moment that has been too big for them to handle. That's your culture that you always talk about. Uh, Speaking of big moments, Torpchenko is getting amazing experience in the playoffs, a bit of ice time. First of all, your thoughts on how he's doing so far in this series and what this could mean for him next year, the playoff experience itself. Well, it puts him in a really good spot to make the team. You know, Craig Berube obviously has shown some favoritism here, which is fine. I mean, coaches are allowed to pick favorites when the guy plays the game the right way. Right. And Torpchenko is an absolute psychopath in the best way possible. I don't even know what the hell he's going to do next. Yeah. I don't know if he knows what he's going to do next. But he's six foot six. He skates as fast as anybody on the team. He's not afraid to hit anybody. Like, he doesn't pick and choose. Like, if it's Kaprizov, he hits him. If it's Nick Delorier, he hits him. He's like, I don't care. You guys right, can all yeah. try to kill me. I'm doing my job. Right. He goes to the front of the net. He'll slide face first in front of a shot. He doesn't care. I love what he brings to the table. And the best part about it is you put him with Tyler Bozak, who is Mr. Steady, where if you notice last game, Tyler Bozak in the third period, uh, he played almost every second shift. Why? Because he's got that experience, and he's going he's gonna to be able to close out that game for you. So you put him with Torpchenko, and then whoever you're playing on the right wing, whether it's uh, Tarasenko, Buchnevich, Kairou, whatever, that line becomes so much better. So I think that he's done a really good job. I think he still has more to give. I think he'll be a bigger factor as the series goes on and further down the road if the Blues advance past the Wild. And it sets himself up really good for next season. Why does this 11-7 combination for the Blues with forwards and defensemen seem to work so well? Because if you're, you know, I mean, just me looking at it as a as a decent hockey fan, I go, well, I still feel like you're shorthanded, but not the way the Blues play. No, and that's kind of what I've been describing is, so you're the Minnesota Wild. Put yourself in their shoes. They're trying to match lines. They're trying to find some breathing room for their top three lines. So they put out the fourth line. And usually the rule of thumb is whenever the other team, like if the Blues put out the fourth line, we put out our fourth line. Let's do battle here. Let's save. Let's spread the ice time out. Problem for the Wild is that when the Blues put on their fourth line, we just talked about it. It's Bozak, Torpchenko, and Tarasenko. Well, that's not a fourth line. (laughs) It's not a fourth line. So. You put out Delorier, Duhame, and uh, Jost, they're like, nah, yeah, nah, where's the fourth line? Don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> right? So that's where the Wild are getting out coached. And this is why it works right now. And can you imagine a power play without Scott Perunovic right now? No. <laughs> that guy is wheeling and dealing. He's every bit um, as good as some of the defensemen in the NHL at walking the line, moving, changing shot angle. The very first game here, they had the four-minute power play. I thought he passed the puck way too much. Mm-hmm. He had to establish the shot. And so I know for a fact that the coaching staff and his teammates said, hey, Scotty, establish a shot. Because by shooting the puck, it's going to close up that diamond that they're playing. They have to respect it then. Because otherwise, if you look at the first game, he was going Tarasenko, Perron, Tarasenko, Perron. Well, the diamond at that point, which is the formation they play on the penalty kill, it's allowed to expand. Because there's no threat of anything through the middle of the ice. So now they're a stick length away from your shooters out wide. The Blues generated what? Zero goals Mm. off that, and that's why. So last game, Scott Perunovic, very first thing he does is he walks, opens the hips, closes the hips. Hard for a defender to know when he's going to shoot, when he's not. He gets a shot through to the net, hits Marc-Andre Fleury, Braden Shen, rebound Ryan O'Reilly, goal. That changes everything. Now the Minnesota Wild have to respect that middle presence. And Ryan O'Reilly now has moved as the bumper into the middle slot. He scored a power play goal here in game four towards the end of the game where they just popped it out to him in the middle. Why? Because the diamond had expanded out wide, which left a spot in the middle. And David Perron and those guys are smart enough to just pop it in the middle, and Ryan O'Reilly scores from there. We've talked a lot about the goalie situation on our side. Would you be surprised to see Talbot in tonight? I, so here's what I think. I think Dean Evason missed his chance. I think that if he was going to change goalies, it should have been last game. Because now the series is so deep. Do you really want to throw a goalie who hasn't played in over two weeks into a playoff series that is uh, the temperature is elevated to where it is? It's an elimination game. I don't know if I would do that. And no, Marc-Andre Fleury, here's the thing about Marc-Andre Fleury. He's been good on the first shots. Mm. He's a first-shot goalie. I don't mean to interrupt you, man, but I feel like this whole series, Jamie, 
whoever I'm watching the game with, I keep saying he's given up rebounds all of the time. When the pre-series scout that we did um, with Bally's, um, and we went over that, Bernie and I, and I just I noticed I you know I'm a I'm a hockey nerd, and so I watch video goal after goal. I'd watch his last ten games, every single goal scored on him, and ninety percent of them were off the rebound. And what he does is he drifts out of the crease, or he drifts out of the angle. And what that means is, so take the Cairo shot the other day here, for example, in game four. Comes down the wing, he shoots, flurries out, square to the puck, but he makes the save and he continues to drift. He doesn't stop his momentum. So what happens is the rebound comes back to the middle of the ice. Flurry's nowhere near anywhere to make the save after that. It's an open net. If you look at most of the goal score, look at David Perron. Go back to game one. All those rebound goals David Perron had. Flurry is sliding in the wrong direction. And then you look at a guy like Jordan Binnington the last couple of games. He's not. He's not sliding out of the blue paint. And if he's sliding, he stops it with the foot and pushes back the other way to take away the angle. Marc-Andre Fleury has always been a first save goalie. Problem is, is he's gotten a little bit older. It just happens. Father time. He's still one of the greatest goalies to ever play in the NHL. I'm not taking away anything. But his style, much like Curtis Joseph used to be this way, Cujo towards the end of his career had it more difficult because the second and third opportunities to make saves weren't there because he was drifting out of an area where he could make a save. Unbelievable. Yeah, and then you give up those rebounds, and you were just talking about how their defense hasn't been that great, and that's where you get the chip-in goals. Though. Yeah, you, but you've got to be willing to go there. Right. And Craig Ruby always talks about got to be willing to get to the hard areas. You have to be willing to get to the front of the net. This is why. This is why. And this is why you don't fly by in those areas. This is why you, have, you go to those areas, the, the, you know, the, the, the house. You go to the house, and you stop. Because things happen there, and they right. happen yeah. all the time. Take the shot and glide into the corner. No, yeah, you can't there. do the uh, the Maverick. Hey, yeah. requesting a flyby here. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually embarrassed how badly I want to see that movie, the new Top Gun movie. Yeah, the preview times in it, freaking incredible. Hey, our boy Hammer times. In yeah, it. man. Be yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, oh crap! I had a question, then I started thinking about Top Gun, and now I've got Danger Zone bouncing around up inside. Oh, oh, I mean, it's to... such an absolute jam. Uh, and, oh, I wanted to ask about Callie Rosen. And I wanted to ask him, you yes, knows what uh, I'm going to say about mm-hmm. Torbchenko and about you know some of these guys that are setting themselves up for next year. Is Rosen one of those guys? He seems to sort of kind of be a vanilla ice cream guy sometimes. He said it. Yeah, he said it. Yeah, yeah. he just does a, everything kind of good. No, right? no, no, no. I'm not saying everything kind of good. I'm just saying like he seems to be very steady. We talk about when we're watching the game and we're not hearing his name mentioned very often. I, that's a good thing, and I feel like he's, yeah. he he might be that guy. Well, the vanilla, but I could be wrong. That's why I'm asking. No, Jeff's right with the vanilla ice cream because what you just described is Carl Gunnarsson, mm. right? And that's what we always call old Gunny was right. vanilla yeah. ice cream. You know, he just nothing crazy, nothing but good steady. You know what you're getting. But is he doing that? Yeah, he absolutely is. I think that there's a lot of things that happened here this season. One, you have Mikola who's stepped up and made a name for himself, and guys who weren't even on the radar, Torpchenko. Um, and Nathan Walker to an extent, but certainly Callie Rosen is a guy. I could see him easily being a part of this roster next year. You know, depending on what Nick Letty does in the off season, I, I think the blues will have a tough time resigning him. I think the demand will be pretty high, especially since people watched him play average to very low average hockey to start the season on a bad team, mind you. And then since he's gotten here, they're like, oh, boy. Yeah. Mm. Now we see, because Nick Letty's kind of a vanilla ice cream, too. Uh, absolutely. He's, a, he's like a, a French vanilla ice cream. He's got a little extra to him there. A little fancier. A little fancier. Still but still, he's so calm out there. He's so poised that it never seems like it's a massive play. It's always like, oh, that was a routine for him. Even though it was something that was really, really exceptional, I think the Blues will have a hard time signing him. Now, if they go all the way and they have a parade down market, that changes a lot of things for guys. Sometimes guys go, hey, you know what? I kind of like that winning stuff. I'd like to stay here. Right. Um, So time will tell. But Callie Rosen is a guy who, as a player in my career, as I started to get creepy along in my year to year, you're not always playing for the team that you're wearing the jersey for. Like right now, Callie Rosen is playing for all the scouts who are at every game, and they're going, okay, Circle this guy because he's unrestricted at the end of this season. And, boy, he'd look good in Seattle. 
or boy, he would look good in Montreal. Or because teams that need players are going to need players that are going to be low cost. Right. So Cali Rosen's probably a, a league minimum guy, seven hundred fifty thousand. You'll definitely get that value out of him. And so sometimes it's hard to play for a team that's established because there's guys that block you because the team's so good and so established. You got too many guys in front of you. Right. But you go to a team that's a little bit lesser, all of a sudden you become fifth or sixth defenseman. Or even if you start as a seventh, you're one injury away from being in a lineup every night. That's what I see for Callie Rosen. Do you see the Blues coaching staff going through any sort of um, change in the offseason, not because anyone will be let go, but because I would feel like this this coaching staff has got to be a very highly regarded one. So at some point or the other, people are going to start trying to trying to cherry pick your guys. Yeah, I think all three assistant coaches are at risk. And I don't mean to be fired. That Oh, yeah, no, not. no, I didn't mean that at all. No, I, to go I, other I, when I say at risk, I want to clarify yeah. that. Um, I, I think that the Philadelphia Flyers are going to seriously look at Jim Montgomery. Um, I think that they're, the Winnipeg Jets are going to seriously take a look at guys like Steve Ott, Mike Van Ryan. I think there's several teams that are going to really, really look at all three guys. Jim Montgomery's been there, done that. Heck, we remember he coached the Dallas Stars. He right. brought us right to the very end. Could have very well advanced and could have very well won a Stanley Cup that year. They were that good. Now he had some personal issues. He rebooted the computer. He's done an incredible job here in St. Louis. He's a great guy. The players love him. So smart. He, I could easily see him moving on to a team. Steve Ott has earned his stripes. Mike Van Ryan has earned his stripes. Those guys, though, they have a luxury. A luxury of picking a, a situation that works for them. Arizona Coyotes, maybe they'll be looking for a coach again. Who knows? Like, there's teams that right now have coaches. Like, Barry Trost just got let go out of the New York Islanders. Jim Montgomery would be a good fit there as well. He's very offensive-minded. And Lou Lamorello is tired of the defense-first mentality. He wants to, you know, crank it up a little bit offensively. So is that why Trotz got let go? I, that I, still confuses me a bit, Jamie. I don't. Listen, Donnie, it's one of the stra- – apart from Gerard Gallant being fired from the Vegas Golden Knights – this is one of the strangest things I've ever seen because he took a team that was the worst team defensively in the NHL, and the very next season they were the best team defensively. He took a team that was a perennial loser, didn't make the playoffs for forever. They were a laughing stock in New York. I know. I played there when they were a laughing stock. <laughs> I was a laughing stock. I get it. He turned that around. The Islanders were taken very seriously. They went to two conference finals. While he was coached there, he made the playoffs. He did all sorts of miraculous things with that franchise. Uh, I don't know if there was a difference of opinion. I don't know if Lou Lamorello, uh, at the age of 80, is thinking clearly, maybe. Lou Lamorello always talks about there's nobody bigger than the organization, except if him. your name is Lou. Him. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't – Barry Trotz, I guarantee that the moment that, that this hit the news wire, his phone was ringing. Because isn't he from Manitoba? So would Winnipeg potentially be a destination? It is. I think that Barry Trotz will have his pick of the litter. Um, now, does Barry Trotz want to go through a rebuild? Right. Because if he, if it's that case, maybe it's the Philadelphia Flyers. Maybe it's the Detroit Red Wings. Maybe like because those teams are out there; they're available. Or does he want to go to a team that's just a little bit of ways away? The Winnipeg Jets from Man- Vegas Golden Knights. Pete DeBoer's not in the clear out there yet. They could uh, be making some changes. Sour face, Sam? Mm. Oh, I hate to see it. <laughs> they could be making some changes there, too. And a guy like Barry Trotz would be really, really good in Vegas with that team. Well, you got to think, and you talked about it on the last podcast, there's going to be some changes in Vegas. Isn't it nice that all of these coaches coming and going and all that stuff, you don't have to worry about it here. Not We're so good. Right. The problem we'll have is that people want our right. coaches. Yes. yes. And then our coaches will have to make a decision on whether or not they stay or whether or not they jump at the opportunity. It's life changing to be a head coach in the NHL, and what I mean by that is the opportunity plus the money. Yeah, you know, you go from making the assistant coaches here. I don't know what they make, but overall in the NHL, some of them it varies from like two hundred fifty thousand a year to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Pretty good living, mm-hmm. to say the least. But then, like starting salary as a head coach is like three million, two and a half to three million. So you would take that chance. You, in, you most of the time, you to. get a three year deal for your first contract. You do the math. That's like. I don't say life-changing money, but it's 
it's kind of a it's, life changing situation. Car, it's car changing money. That's Do you know how sure. many hockey cards I could buy with that? <laughs> lots. I mean, a whole yeah, heck lots. of a lot. <laughs> yeah. Lots. yeah. And I could bring what? back no. spinning wheels with that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's about time the coaches get compensated um, as much as the players are because they're a massive part of it. Yeah. And the hours that they put in are crazy. I mean, they're at the rink at 7 a.m. And like tonight, they, they probably got to the rink 7 30, 8 o'clock. They won't leave the rink until 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, maybe even longer. So do the math on that one. That's just a day. That works out to be about 8 bucks an hour. Isn't it? <laughs> is that right? You're not wrong. I mean, that's a, <laughs> your your math take. is a little off, but I smell what you're stepping in. <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, uh, as always, it has been a blast. Blues and Wild tonight, uh, game number six. And hopefully when we, uh, we, we reconvene, we'll be talking about a second-round series. Round number two. Bam, baby. Jeff Burton, Jamie Rivers, Donnie Fandango, thank you very much for listening to the Last Minute Blues podcast. And as always, let's go Blues. The Last Minute Blues Podcast. Hear more at 1057thepoint.com. Powered by Together Credit Union. Empowering you to achieve your financial goals.